Good morning. Um, welcome to our live stream uh, from St Nick's. It's great to have you tuning in uh, to join us. Today is All Saints Day, which is the day when we thank God for other believers, especially those who've been an example to us. Um, we're going to continue our series in 1 Peter. We'll be thinking about what it means uh, to be God's scattered elect, his saints, his people in a world that doesn't know him. I guess we probably feel particularly scattered at the moment, um, uh, with news coming in that we're about to be scattered even more, um, with all the restrictions coming in on meeting each other. And Peter says the solution is to change our focus. Um, so can we have our verse for this morning? 1 Peter 1, verse 13 says, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. So as Christians, we're looking forward to the day when Jesus comes back. And on that day, we'll get the inheritance that we were thinking about last week. Peter says that looking forward should change the way we act now. We should be alert. And that means that we should be ready. Tim is going to help the grown-ups think a bit more about that uh, in a few minutes. Um, but for now, it might look a bit like this. Busy. Time to get ready for cricket. I am ready. Digby's obviously really excited about his cricket match. Um, cricket's important to Digby, so he's made sure he's ready. Um, and it looks like he even slept in his kit. And now, when his dad comes in, he's awake, he's alert, and on he's B. ready to go. Well, how about on this B, come on, team? it's time to get ready for cricket. Oh, oh it's a really rough night last night. Let's have a look at our verse again. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. We know that Jesus is coming back, and so we should be alert and ready, and that will change the way we behave now. But having that future focus is really hard, and if we're honest, we don't manage it most of the time. So it's right that we confess our sin. In this next prayer, um, please join in the bits that say, Lord, hear us and help us. Um, Jesus Christ, say, Lord, risen master and triumphant and Lord. Us. Jesus Christ, risen master and triumphant Lord. We come to you in sorrow for our sins and confess to you our weakness and unbelief. We have lived by our own strength and not by the power of your resurrection. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. We have lived by the light of our own eyes as faithless and not believing. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. We have lived for this world alone and doubted our sin. And we're going to sing about that now. Let's sing together. That in Jesus, God has dealt with our sin. And we're going to sing about that now. Let's sing together.
want to find something to entertain yourselves while the grown-ups listen to the sermon. Um, but Alex is going to come and read from Exodus chapter 12 and 1 Peter chapter 1. If you've got a Bible at home, it'd be great to grab it and turn to the 1 Peter reading um, so that you can follow along while Tim is preaching. The Old Testament reading is taken from the book of Exodus, chapter 12, verses 1 to 13. The Passover. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, Each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roasted over a fire with the head, legs, and internal organs. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it. With your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. And I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. 
I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. The New Testament is taken from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 to 21. Be holy. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handled, handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so, your faith and hope are in God. Thanks be to God. Please keep 1 Peter 1 open, and we are looking this morning at verses 13 to 21. Verse 13 of 1 Peter chapter 1. And verse 13 begins with a therefore, and the therefore signals that Peter is changing gear. He is switching to application. He's applying the truths that he outlined in verses 3 to 12 of chapter 1. Let's look back at those verses. Verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why, Peter? Because in his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. And Peter is saying, because of this great inheritance, you need to live like this. And this morning I have three points to help explain Peter's application to us. They are slightly contrived, uh, but they may help you remember. They are stay alert, control the virus, and slave lives. Firstly, stay alert. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. And commentators say that the 17th century version of the Bible, the King James, says it best. Gird up the loins of your mind. In Peter's day, they wore robes. And the robes were not practical for getting on with work and physical activity. So the men used to gather up the robes and tuck them in their belts. And our equivalent is to roll our sleeves up. In a sporting context, it's to rub in the deep heat or to chalk our hands or to put the pads on. It means prepare yourself for action, get ready. 
I have a special tie for business meetings, or at least I used to. I now work from home and barely remember to shave. But Peter is saying, focus, be ready. Through much of this letter, Peter is referring directly or indirectly to Old Testament passages. And here, he's actually alluding back to the Passover. That story uh, we read from Exodus chapter 12, the story of deliverance from Egypt. Moses says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says over and over again, no. There are ten plagues, and the final plague is the death of the firstborn son. And Exodus 12, 11 says, This is how you are to eat it, the Passover, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Be ready for the journey. Judgment is coming to Egypt. Have your clothes on and your bags packed. You've got to catch an early flight. Be ready and focused for what? Sorry, be ready and be focused on what? Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. One of my heroes is Justin Langer, the Australian cricket coach. And one of his mantras is the pain of discipline is less than the pain of disappointment. The hours on the training ground, the early morning runs, the constant watching of diet. Why does the sportsman or woman do it? They hope in the future, the podium, the cup final, the chance to raise the bat at Lord's. Peter says, focus on the prize. Why be a Christian? Peter challenges us to put this first, ahead of all other ambitions in life. To live for this, not a cup final, or our finals, or a final salary pension scheme, but the final day. Stay alert and focus on that final day. When Jesus is revealed, it will then be proved beyond all doubt to have been worth it. Secondly, control the virus. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. The virus we all face is that of sin, of being conformed to evil desires. And Peter says, don't conform, instead be holy. He quotes from Leviticus 19, be holy because I am holy. What does the word holy mean? It means different, set apart, distinctive. It means purity and perfection. It is what God is like. And Peter echoes Leviticus and says, be like that. How on earth can we do it? In my job, I've worked with a coach, and the method that he utilizes is the uh, Myers-Briggs personality types. And they're based on the work and theories of the psychologist Carl Jung. And against each personality type, the coach assigns a color. He then shows us how our color or personality influences for good or bad, how we operate and how we lead our teams. And one of the tricks of leadership he's trying to teach us is knowing when your preferred color, your preferred style, is not what is needed for a situation and being able to do another color. In working with us, he's very, very careful to say, you need to do more and not be more. We can't be another color. We can't change our personality, but we need to know when to do some of the behaviors of another color. Why am I telling you all this? Well, Peter says, be holy because I am holy. And the Christian can be holy because we are now children. That's what verse 3 of chapter 1 says. Through the new birth of verse 3. We can bear the family likeness. We can be a chip off the old block. And please note that this is true only if we're adopted into the family. If we've had that new birth. If we try to do holiness without the new birth, it will end in ugliness. It will be like the Pharisees, washing the outside, but inwardly horrible. In fact, if we try to do it like a self-help program, it will lead to exactly all the things that Peter at the beginning of chapter 2 says we're to rid ourselves of. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. So... Control the virus by being holy. 
Thirdly and finally, slave lives. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. We have been saved, so how should we live? We should live with reverent fear. This doesn't mean to be scared or frightened of God. It means to live in awe of a father who will one day judge the whole world. Why should we live like this, though? Well, Peter goes back again to the Passover illustration, back to Egypt and that last awesome night of God's judgment. The only way in which the angel of death would pass over the firstborn son was if the blood of a lamb without blemish had been painted on the door of the house. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. The only way for us to be saved is by the death of God's firstborn son, the one whom John the Baptist declared was the lamb of God. And Peter is saying, we have been saved at infinite cost, and therefore knowing this, live in reverent fear. In chapter 2 uh, and verse 16, he, he tells us to live as God's slaves, freed from Egypt, from the slavery of Egypt. Now we are to be God's slaves. Paul says to the Corinthians, you are not your own, you were bought with a price, and that price was the precious blood of Christ. The hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, ends with an incredibly challenging verse. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. That's it. That's living in reverent fear. May God forgive my failure, may God forgive our failure, and may God give us new motivation to live in this way. So let's stay alert by focusing on that ultimate day. Let's control the virus of sin by shunning evil desires and instead be holy. And let's live slave lives by remembering the costly price that had to be paid. Amen. Our next song is a chance to reflect on what Tim's been saying and to dwell on just how good Jesus is.
we just heard uh, Tim preaching to us uh, from 1 Peter, and I thought we could pick his brains a little bit more about one or two of the things he said. So, Tim, you um, reference the Old Testament quite a lot uh, in your sermon. Um, does that mean that in order for me to understand 1 Peter, I need to be some kind of expert in the Old Testament? Um, no. Um, I think knowing the, knowing the Old Testament can be incredibly helpful uh, because it, it, it shows us that the Bible is one, one book, that it's one story going all the way through from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. And that really strengthens our conviction. Um, it strengthens our belief, uh, gives us more confidence to trust the Bible, um, and it helps us to praise um, but in the same way as um, most of us don't know the Greek, I certainly don't. We don't know the Hebrew. Um, we, we don't know the culture in detail of the Old or New Testament times and all the uh, socioeconomic environment and all of those things which would be incredibly useful to know. And they would probably help us understand the Bible an awful lot as well. Um, we don't need to know all of that, but it is it's useful um, it's a bit like the internet, the Bible. You start clicking, and before you know it, you can keep clicking and digging and digging and digging, um, and you find more and more truth that just reinforces each other. Thanks. That's really, really cool to see how the whole thing uh, fits together and that it is, as you say, one big um, story. And intellectually, that's quite satisfying. Those of us who like finding links. Um, does it make any difference in real life? Um, so the, the, the more we dig into it, I think it, you know, it, it does strengthen our conviction and show forth in a more of a life of uh, praise. But um, the more I dug into, uh, into this particular um, passage from Peter, the more I could see how it was actually really useful uh, for the really, really big questions of life. If you like, it helps us... Uh, with those existential questions, you know, who am I, why am I here, what's my purpose, what's my identity, what's my significance? Um, because those questions are actually being answered by Peter, and we can see that they're being answered all the way through. So one way it helps us, I think, is we can see we're connected. We're not just randomly here in 2020. We can see we're connected back to believers for thousands and thousands of years, all the way back to the Old Testament, so we can see we've got um, history and an identity. But also, those are the questions that Peter is actually um, answering here. You know, what is our purpose? Well, our purpose is to live focused on this future day. Uh, what is our identity? Well, we're, 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 we're children of God, um, and we're to be holy. That's our identity. And what's our significance? Well, we're incredibly valuable because actually we've been bought with this precious pri uh, price, which is the precious blood of Christ. So it gives us a purpose, it gives us identity, it gives us significance. And of course, then Peter then uses that as a springboard um, to actually show how it's incredibly relevant practically for all sorts of areas of life. Um, obeying the government, which is something we're all going to have to really think about over the next uh, few weeks as our do's and don'ts uh, get more. Um, how we should live as employees, as employers, as husbands, as wives. Um, it's all there, um, actually, in, in 1 Peter. And he uses these, this first chapter as a springboard to show how practically relevant it is for everyday life. Thanks very much. That's uh, really helpful uh, to hear a few more of your thoughts on that, Tim. And now Nigel Shepherd's going to come and lead us in. Yesterday was Halloween, or All Hallows' Eve, or All Saints' Eve. And today is All Saints' Day, when in particular we pray for those who have died over the last year. So it is right that we begin our prayers with the Church of England Collect for the day. At the end of the Collect, and, and at the end of each prayer, I will say, Lord, in your mercy. And your response at home and here at church is, hear our prayer. Let us pray. 
Almighty God, you have knitted together your elect in one communion and fellowship in the mystical body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Grant us grace so to follow your blessed saints in all virtuous and godly living, that we may come to those inexpressible joys that you have prepared for those who truly love you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we bring to you all those who have lost their lives over this last year. May their loved ones take comfort in your guiding hands, and for all those who mourn, may, your comfort, may you comfort and heal them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. A prayer for all those affected by coronavirus. Keep us, good Lord, under the shadow of your mercy. Sustain and support the anxious. Be with those who care for the sick, and lift up all who are brought low that we may find comfort knowing that nothing can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those working in hospital or in medical research, gracious God, give skill, sympathy and resilience to all who are caring for the sick and your wisdom to those searching for a cure. Strengthen them with your spirit that through their work may will be restored to health through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. A prayer for our nation. God of hope, in these times of change, unite our nation and guide our leaders with your wisdom. Give us courage to overcome our fears and help us to build a future in which all may prosper and share. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us combine all our prayers in one with us all in our homes and here in church, saying together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We've got uh, time for a few notices now. Um, the number to text this morning if you want to uh, say hello or something else to the rest of the church family is not Jonty's number because Jonty's on holiday. Uh, it's on the screen. It's 07725 053 330. 07725 053 330. And while we wait for the... Uh, messages to come in. Um, next Sunday uh, is Remembrance Sunday um, and uh, the service will be live streamed as normal. This slide, um, as you may have guessed, is now out of date. Um, very sadly, uh, it appears that the government is now saying that um, churches cannot have public uh, worship services from uh, Thursday and we had been hoping to invite a live congregation in now that we've ironed out some of the problems with the live stream. Um, but uh, it looks like that's not going to be possible. Um, but we will be having a service um, on the YouTube channel at 10.45. Um, and I think this point's a good point to say thank you uh, to all those who've worked so hard to get the live stream running from church, particularly to Harry, who has spent um, hours uh, battling with the technology um, and has done an excellent job the last three weeks um, of keeping up with all the... Um, unforeseen developments during the service um, with our various audio and video. Uh, we're starting a new month, uh, you may have noticed. Um, so uh, it's the prayer meeting on Thursday. Um, 
we'll be meeting on Zoom um, uh, from 7.30 till 8.30. Um, and it's the number that we used to use for virtual coffee, um, which is up on the screen at the moment. Uh, we'd love you to join us as we bring um, various things in the life of the church and in the wider world um, before our God. Um, what's coming on my phone? Hannah Findlay says, great, church, great service this morning. Uh, Rachel and Harry say, Anna, so grateful for you leading the service this morning. Um, Jonty says, lovely to watch the service from Holiday at Home, and thanks to Tim for a really clear sermon. Uh, Hannah Findlay is particularly um, grateful for the... Um, song that we sang after the sermon, The Goodness of Jesus, um, as a timely reminder. Sylvia says, great team today, really enjoyed the service. Many thanks, Sylvia. Margaret and Ian White say, thank you to everyone who has contributed this morning to such a helpful service. Uh, love to all. Uh, Becky agrees with John T um, that uh, she very much enjoyed Tim's sermon, particularly the headings. Thank you for the um, puns. That's all the messages I've got now. Um, virtual coffee won't be happening this week, but uh, why not um, put our theme verse for this year into action and give someone a call from church, see how they're, going, see how they're doing while um, Sunday lunch is cooking. Uh, we're going to finish with an old hymn that asks God to lift our eyes um, to him and to our future, um, pointing to him as our light and our inheritance.
Sorry? Oh, I'm told that was not audible outside of the building. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen.